Is it possible for a large church to drift away from God and become cold? The answer is yes. It is possible for many hearts to become cold because coldness of heart is contagious. A church may continue to go through the motions without any emotion. The hearts of the people have drifted away from God. The heart is what keeps any relationship going. Relationships are affected when the heart drifts away and becomes cold. This is what causes the breakup of so many relationships today. The heart drifts slowly away and becomes cold. Someone said that the heart of every problem is a problem of the heart. This morning in our text, Jesus is going to address such a church that had slowly drifted away from God. We will see that it started right, but because of carelessness, the passion was gone and the validity of the profession was gone. Today, we will learn about the careless church. Please turn with me to our text. We're still in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, as we continue where we stopped last week. There's four parts, four different churches in that chapter. There's the careless church in the first seven verses. Then we have the crippled church, verses 8 to 11. After that, we have the compromising church, verses 12 to 17, and the corrupted church, 18 to 21. So let's take a look at the careless church. If you ever had to move to a new location and had to select a new church home, you know how difficult it is to examine and evaluate a church and its ministry. An impressive building with a great website may house a dying or dead congregation, while a modest structure, even a barn, with a simple website might belong to an active congregation on fire for the Lord. The church that we think is rich may turn out to be poor in God's sight while the church that appears to be poor may actually be rich in God's sight. Only the head of the church, Jesus Christ, can accurately inspect a church and know its condition because he sees the internal, not only the external like we do. In these seven special messages to the seven churches in Asia Minor, the Lord gave each church an x-ray of its condition. But he also intended for all the churches to read the messages and to benefit from them. At the same time, the Lord also was speaking to individuals and this is where you and I come in. Even though it is addressed to a church, it applies to us. Do not be deceived and think that these messages do not apply to us personally. Jesus is not writing to buildings, but to people who make up the church. A church is not a building, but people assembled together to worship God. The statement of Jesus, he who has an ear, let him hear, shows that it is written to people. 
So while we read these messages, we need to apply them personally as we examine our own heart. In the four churches of chapter 2, we see four different types of hearts. The first one is a cold heart, verses 1 to 7. The next one is a confused heart, verses 8 to 11. The third one is a carnal heart, verses 12 to 17. And the last one is a crooked heart, verses 18 to 29. In a sense, the seven letters to the seven churches are like form letters. Each letter is made up of the same seven components. The first one is the addressee to the angel of the church of. Then we have the author, says he who, and then he talks about who he is. The addressee, the author, the awareness. I know your works. And he says that to all of them. Then we have the assessment. You have this, you have that. You, he knows. So this is the assessment. Then we have the assignment. Remember or be faithful or repent or hold fast. He has an assignment for each one. Then he has an agreement. He who overcomes, I will give. The agreement is with the overcomer. And finally, number seven, we have the appeal. He who has an ear, let him hear. So every letter has those same seven components. So let's start with the first church, the careless church, and learn about a cold heart. In that church, we see three main things. We see the works of that church in the first three verses. Then we see the weakness of that church in the next verse, four. And then we have the warning to that church, verses five to seven. A commendation for its works, an accusation for its weakness, and a warning to change a few things. So Jesus starts, and he says in verse one, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstand. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostle, and they are not. And they have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. People wonder, is the letter really addressed to an angel? And the answer is no. The Greek word for angel is a title. It is not a description of a being. And the title is messenger, but it was also used for bishop or presiding elder in a particular church. So in those days, as well as today, a church had elders, but one man was responsible. He was the overseer of the church, one man not a plurality of leadership. If God intended a church to have a plurality of leadership, the addressee in each church here would be different. It would be plural. It would not be one specific man. That man whom God held responsible to bring his message to the church is receiving this letter. The addressee is the pastor of the church. And Jesus began with Ephesus, the city closest to Patmos where John was. 
and he will make his way around. It was a great commercial center. We are told in Acts chapter 19 that the church of Ephesus was actually established by Paul. Then Apollos, Aquila, and Priscilla, his wife, also ministered there. Paul came and he watered what had been planted. He remained there over two years. Apollos, Aquila, and his wife Priscilla, not Presley, they reaped from the work of Paul. And do not be confused. The messenger here is not Paul. He was dead by then. Earlier, Paul addressed one of his letters to the church of Ephesus. So this letter here might be called the second letter to the church of Ephesus. This time, the letter is coming from Jesus Christ himself, not from Paul, not from John. John was simply told to write. He acted as secretary. He was commanded by Jesus, chapter 1, verse 19, to write. And he wrote exactly what Jesus told him to write. These are the word of Jesus, not the word of John. This section is pretty hard to challenge or question concerning divine inspiration. Jesus is dictating, John is writing. Where else do you see this in the Bible? In the Old Testament, from the book of Exodus, all the way to the book of Deuteronomy, God dictated, Moses wrote. The stationery store, sometimes they sell a little memo pad with your name printed at the top from the desk of Mary Louise Brown. It helps to recognize immediately from whom the message is coming. Here at the top of the memo pad, we have from the desk of he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. This is the addressor, the sender. Who that? There can be no mistake whatsoever concerning the source of this message. John described him earlier in verse 13. Jesus being in the midst of the seven lamb stand. And in verse 16, as holding the seven stars in his right hand. The message is from Jesus to the church of Ephesus. Next, in verses 2 and 3, we have the awareness and the assessment of the church. Jesus says that he is aware. He is very familiar with this church. I know your works. First, we have the praise and the admiration of Jesus for that church. He has 10 good things to say about that church. Number one, he says, I know your works. And this phrase is repeated to each church because Jesus knew the condition of each of those churches. He knows everything. It is not possible to hide anything from him. Everything is open and naked before him. These words can be scary or they can be comforting. It all depends on what the works are. If they are evil, then they're scary words. I know your works. If they are good, the comforting words, I know your works. I know your performance, he says. I know how you work. The next one, number two, says, I know your labor. Not the same thing as work. The Greek word for, wor the Greek word for works means performance, accomplishment. James used it in chapter two to prove the validity of faith. 
The Greek word for labor means exhaustion, fatigue. It is possible to work without putting out a real effort. Ephesus was a hard-working church. There was plenty of activity going on in that church. I know you gave your all, he's saying. Number three says, I know your patience, your long-suffering, your endurance towards the people, referring to the quality of not surrendering to circumstances nor giving up on the trials. It is hard to be patient with circumstances and be long-suffering with people. That church was doing that. Number four, it says, you cannot endure those who are evil. Believe it or not, this is also equality. Equality, it's a good thing. It is very important for the health of the body to purge itself of poison. When a body becomes too weak to purge itself of poison, that body will soon die. This is a characteristic of a healthy church. Ephesus was still healthy enough to purge itself of poison. They did not tolerate evil, and Jesus praised them for that. So when the, someone will tell you to tolerate evil, tolerate all, this is not what Jesus is praising there. Number five, he says, you have tested those supposed apostles. They had discernment. Some claimed to be apostles, but they were not. They were masquerading as apostles, saying they were, but the church tested them, examined them, and rejected them. Anybody can say anything. It is what they do that counts. Words are cheap. But you may wonder, can such judgment be made on people? Can we test people? You bet we can. It is scriptural. When Jesus said in Matthew 7, 1, judge not, the word there means condemn not. We are not to condemn, but we are to test and discern. Jesus said to beware of false teachers. How can we do that without first examining and judging if what they are doing or saying is false or not? On what basis can a judgment be made? Only on one basis, the Word of God. We need to test if what they are doing is scriptural or if... What they are saying is scriptural. This is the only way to test and see if they are apostles or deceivers. False teachers do not accept the word of God as the final, final authority. They seek to use experiences as an authority as well. And they say, it might not be in the Word of God, but I have experienced it. Then there cannot be a final authority because there will always be new experiences. The Word of God is the only final authority, and it cannot change. <clears throat> then number six, <clears throat> he said, you have persevered. You have taken much and endured it. You were not quitters. You kept going. You stood fast. This is all past tense. This one is an action. You have persevered. Number seven is you have patience. Jesus is not repeating again that the church had endured a lot. They are patient and diligent. This one is present tense. This one is an attitude. One is an action. The other one is an attitude. 
Number eight, you have labored for my name's sake. The key words are for my name's sake. They had done a lot of things specifically for the name of Jesus. Then number nine, he says, you have not become weary. They did not get fed up or tired of doing well. They did not stop because they had done a lot or had been doing it for a long time. And then the last one, number 10, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Verse 6, he says, you are like me in this one thing, and we will see what it means when we are at verse 6. All these are commendable, admirable qualities for a church. If people would see a church like this today, they would say that this is one fine church. They are well organized. They are out there tirelessly. And look at all their work. Isn't this a wonderful church? Jesus says, no, it is not. Even though the people in Ephesus had these 10 things going for them, still there was one main thing against them. One thing was lacking, and it canceled out everything else they had been doing, all those 10 good things. What is it? Jesus goes on, and he says, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this thing against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first work, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So after the commendation, we have the condemnation. The word nevertheless is just like the word but. It usually cancels what was said in a previous statement. Oh, it's a nice dress, but. But what? The but cancel the previous statement. It is not really a nice dress. Even though they had the work, the perseverance, the labor, the patience, the endurance, still the Lord had one thing against them. Now, the old King James Version says, I have somewhat against you. The new King James Version says, I have this against you. Both words, somewhat and this, are in italic meaning that they have been added by the translator. It should say, I have against you that you have left your first love. The word somewhat is not a good translation. If you have an old King James, cross that somewhat. It makes it sound as if it is no big deal. It's just a little somewhat thing against you. No, it is a major thing. It is so important that unless they correct it, they will cease to exist as a body of Christ. What is the condemnation? You have left your first love. I know that Paul talked about the importance of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, loving one another. This is not what Jesus is saying here. They had plenty of love for one another. They could not have done all that they did if they did not have love for one another. That's not the issue. They had left their first love. Their love for Jesus, Jesus, who is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. It is possible for a church to function very well, to do all kinds of work, and yet be lacking the most essential element, 
love for God's word. If the devil cannot captivate your heart, he will try to refrigerate your heart. Notice, it does not say they lost their first love. They left it. If you have lost something, you do not know what it is or where to go to find it. If you have left something, you always know where to go back to get it. Unless you're old like me and you don't remember where you left it, then it's lost. Something can be lost quite by accident, but leaving it is a deliberate act. They had deliberately left their first love because their heart was cold. But praise the Lord, the situation is correctable. Next, we have the assignment to the church. Jesus has three steps for restoration. Three R for us to remember. The step number one is remember from where you have fallen. Remember when you first experienced God's forgiveness and God's grace. Remember the relationship that you had with God when you started to walk with him. Remember how close you were to God, how you love spending time with God and spending time in his word. When the prodigal son was in the pig pan, the first step in his restoration was to remember what his life was like back at home with his dad in Luke chapter 16. This is always the first step in getting back to where we should be with the Lord. Remember, that's the first step. Number two is repent. He said it twice. The word means to rethink, think differently, reconsider, have a change of heart, a change of direction, turn from this cold, drifting state, repent. And then step number three is return or redo. Return to what you used to do. Redo. Do again the first work. What does he mean? He just commanded them for all their works. He means to go back to the first thing they used to love, which is the word of God. They had left that. Then the Lord adds two scary words, or else. An old man was walking to his car one night, and a young man with a gun came to him and said, hands up or else. The old man asked, or else what? The, old man said, the, the young man said, don't confuse me, it's my first job. Here we see that the situation is very serious. When someone tells you or else, look out. It is serious. Unless they change and return to their first love, Jesus confirms what will happen. He says, I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. What is he talking about? What will happen if they do not change? We saw earlier in chapter 1 that Jesus was in the midst of the seven lamp stand, the seven churches. Each of the seven churches had its place around Jesus. Each was a light shining for Jesus. What Jesus is saying here is that he is going to remove them from that place next to him. Sort of saying, if you continue in that state, I'm out of here. 
You have left your first love. You have left me, my word, so I will leave you. Looking around the country today, we can see many churches in that condition, completely dead. They have left their love for the word of God, so the presence of Jesus has been removed from them. To prevent that, they must do three things. Remember, repent, return. Many are still involved in all kinds of work, but Jesus is no longer walking in their midst. They left their first love, so Jesus left them. What a sad situation. But over and over in the Old Testament, God repeated that if they would forsake him, he would forsake them. They did, so he did. And then Jesus ends the letter and he says, verse 6, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The last good thing the church had was a hate for the deeds of the Nicolaitan. Verse 6. Jesus does not explain what it is. But he said that he hated it also. Whatever it is, it must be pretty bad for Jesus to say that he hates it. Very rarely do we hear Jesus say or use that term, I hate. Now, some people say that the Nicolaitans were a sect in the early church formed by a man named Nicholas, a converted Jew from Antioch that is mentioned in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. They say that they were a group with moral looseness. This teaching, however, is without any historical evidence. There's no way to check this out. But the meaning of the word explains pretty well what it is and what they were doing. All we have to do is take this word apart. In the Greek language, nikos means to conquer, to rule over. The next one, laos, means laity, the people, not the clergy. Together, the word would mean to rule over the people, the laity, the establishing of a spiritual hierarchy, placing people between God and man to intercede to God for the rest of the people to show that they are spiritually above other people, above the laity, they usually wear different clothes to be quickly identified, quickly recognized as spiritual leaders. The deeds of the Nicolaitans is the establishing of a spiritual hierarchy having men above others in holy ranks placing themselves between God and men. That is one famous doctrine. It's called the shepherding doctrine. Typical example of the deed of the Nicolaitan. What is it? Under the shepherding doctrine, the people must submit totally to their shepherd or spiritual overseer. They cannot make any decision without first consulting the shepherd and get his permission, even if it is buying a new refrigerator. Could not make any decision without the shepherd. Jesus says he hates this. We see in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3, that God calls the ministers servant not lords. He says in his word not to lord over the flock. 
the church of Ephesus hated to rule over the laity, a good thing. And as we continue, we will see that this thing later was embraced by the church of Pergamos when we get there. Yes, God established the priesthood. It was necessary up to the time of Jesus Christ, the great high priest of the new covenant, the last priest. The reason was because men could not approach God. Jesus died to abolish any and all religious system. He died to open the door for every man to come directly to the Father through him. There is no need of in-betweens anymore. No need of Nicolaitans. God hates it. We see lastly in verse 7 that the Lord is also speaking to individuals. Churches are made up of individuals, and those individuals determine the spiritual life of the assembly. Seven times Jesus repeated to hear. The warning in these two chapters are very important. We should pay attention. We should hear what the Spirit is saying. Now, even though it says what the Spirit says to the churches, it is still Jesus speaking, proving that Jesus and the Spirit are one. There's only one God. Three person, one God. Then Jesus closes the letter to Ephesus with a promise to whomever will overcome. This is also repeated to each church. There are overcomers in every church. Those who are overcome are overcome because they drift away from the word. They give up the word. Jesus is the word, and they leave their first love. So verse 7 is a very important verse. It proves that the Lord has true believers, true saints in every church. Overcomers will make it in. We do not condemn people, but we should condemn the systems of men. They have corrupted the truth of God. What is the promise to them? To eat from the tree of life. When we eat of this tree, we will be in our new bodies. When was the last time we saw this tree of life? In the very beginning of the book, in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 3. This tree made people live forever. Adam chose to eat of the other three, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree, this tree will reappear in the new Jerusalem where it will be <coughs> bearing abund abundant fruit. We will see it one more time in Revelation chapter 22. Now, there are three applications of these seven letters, three ways to apply them, and each one of them, and I will show each application of each of those churches. There is a literal application. There is a historical application, and there is a personal application. Literally, each of these churches existed in Asia Minor. They are not made up names of churches, but literal churches that existed. There was an actual church in Ephesus. Historically, they represent seven different periods of church history. This church of Ephesus represents the first period, the early apostolic church from 35 A.D. to 150 A.D., the church that started on the day of Pentecost 
and continued to the death of the apostle. That church, born of the Spirit, motivated by love, did a lot of work for Jesus. It reached the world for Jesus. Paul said to the Colossians, the gospel has come unto you as in all the world. But somehow it drifted away. The very beginning of church history, the first one, drifted away. Jesus said, it has fallen, verse 5. They were still doing a lot of work, but they had lost their love for the word. The church of Ephesus was a careless church made up of careless believers who carelessly neglected their love for God, their love for God's word. They were very busy doing a lot of things, but they drifted away from the love of God's word because they had a cold heart. We who have an ear to hear, can we hear what the Spirit is saying? That church in Ephesus was quite a church. Looking at it, we see that it was a serving church, busy doing the work of the Lord. It was a sacrificing church, laboring for Christ. It was a steadfast church, enduring trials and persevering. It was a sanctified church, separated from the false doctrines and the false apostles and evil deeds. It started as a careless church, and it abandoned its first love, the Word. It ended up being a fallen church. It had pro programs without passion. It had great statistics, but drift away from a heartfelt devotion to Christ and his word. Fortunately, first love can always be restored. Three easy steps. Remember, repent, return. Personally, you may be full of work. You may be busy serving. You may be opposed to wickedness, opposed to false teachers, not fainting in the day of trial, and yet lacking love for God's word. Nothing can compensate for that. Like Martha, who can be so busy working, you can have no time to love the word. Jesus is more concerned with what we do with him than what we do for him. We need to examine ourselves today. Has my heart drifted away from Jesus, from his word? Have I stopped doing my first work? Like Ephesus, you may still look good. There might be a lot of good things to say about you, but have you left your first love, first love for the word? If you read four or five books a year, but never touch the Bible in a year, you have lost your first love. You are in that group. As your heart drifted away and become cold, you can be restored. Three easy steps. Remember, repent, return. Better yet, stay close to the Lord. Stay in the word of God. And do not worry about drifting away like the careless. A lot of people have been confused with this leaving your first love. And they've been thinking, oh, I would never leave God. These people are not leaving God at all. It's the word that they're leaving. In January 10th, 1982, I was ordained pastor, youth pastor, Napa. Been a pastor for 40 years. Do you know how many people I have seen in love with God, in love with the word, 
They could hardly wait for the church door to be opened. They read the Bible every morning. They were new believers. They read a couple of chapters before they went to bed. They were in love with God. They look in the bulletin for any home fellowship, any breakfast, any gathering of any kind to just be with God's people and talk about the Word. They were in love with God, in love with God's Word. Then I watched thousands of them over the years, less and less interested in the word they have left their first love it is not mentioned first by jesus for no reason the most important thing of all the churches you cannot leave your first love if jesus is not your first love it's easy to say i love jesus i love god how do you show it by being interested in him in what he has to say, in what he asks you to do, his word. You cannot walk away from this. This is your first love, your last love, your everlasting love. Very important that we apply this to ourselves today. Church of Ephesus is ruined now. It's done. It's gone. People are still around. We need to learn. We need to fall in love again with God. Fall in love again with the Word of God. Spend time in it. Love it. Park the other books. Pick this one book. Renew your love with God. Return to your first love. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. May he bless your life, your home, your family, your children. May he touch your heart today that you would renew your first love, that you would remember, that you would return, that you would change. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.